Hello everyone. Welcome to a rather sad week in the clown decade. The week where, unfortunately, Queen Elizabeth II of Great Britain and Northern Ireland passed away. You may have heard the news from absolutely everywhere because losing the monarch of one of the best countries and most influential countries in the world is obviously big news. And seeing the amount of footage and images I'm seeing of people gathering together, showing their condolences to the Prince and Princess of Wales, Wills and Kate, to our new King Charles III, and of course to the no longer royals but still part of the family, Harry and Meghan. It has shown that while we may not talk about her all that much and she seems to do little more than wave to the country whenever there's a royal event on, people really did have a very, very deep admiration for the Queen and through that a connection to her, her family and of course the country which she represents. It's absolutely huge that most people appear to be showing their condolences and generally trying to get on with their lives. Though of course there are some exceptions such as the FA deciding to stop all football from top to bottom that includes the Premier League all the way down to the under 11s leagues that the kids play on Sunday and apparently they've even asked parents to please not hold friendlies. In my opinion, that's going slightly too far, given that cricket and rugby are carrying on, just showing the respects in their own way, but unfortunately there are certain football fans you simply cannot trust. And it has also been true that on BBC One we have essentially had wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the death of the Queen, her passing, her funeral, people's tributes to her, and history programmes about her. And of course there has been coverage on other channels as well, such as ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5 though these channels have been nowhere near to the extent of BBC One, but BBC One have a special agreement with the royal family, so of course they're going to have a monopoly on covering this story. However, of course, some people can't keep their mouth shut about how much they think it's a complete disgrace that we still have a monarchy, despite the fact that it has kept our country running very, very well for millennia. And one of these organisations is Navarra Media. Yes, I'm essentially just a full-time anti-Navarra media channel now. Because I think collectively they actually put forward the best arguments that socialists, and in this case, Republicans have. Making it very easy for me to, one, laugh at these arguments, and two, absolutely destroy them. So without further ado, I think we should get into their first video. Which is, Girl Gives Media the Perfect Answer on the Queen's Death. Let's take a look. As millions of people mourn the passing of the Queen, it can feel difficult to know what to say, how to intervene, if you are instinctively Republican. This person, Vox Popped by CNN, got it pitch perfect, though. Well, before we find out what she says, I think my advice to Republicans would be, yes, we know what your opinions on the monarchy are. I think you should keep them to yourself for a few days while people mourn. Which is what the largest Republic group in the UK did on Twitter. Sending out a tweet saying, We are saddened to hear the news of Queen's death and we wish to express our condolences to the royal family. There will be plenty of time to debate the monarchy's future. For now, we must respect the family's personal loss and allow them and others time to mourn to the loss of a mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. Which was a perfectly fine response and what Republicans should probably say. However, this trend could only go on for two days as... On the 10th of September, two days after the Queen died, and Charles III officially took his oaths to be king, Republic had to tweet this image out with hashtag NotMyKing, hashtag abolish the monarchy. So while they did give the country and people time to mourn, it was <laughs> a lot less than the official 10 days of mourning that was put forward by the royal family and the government. But anyway, we're apparently here to see what some random woman in the street said to CNN, so please take it away. I just wonder what you thought, what your first reaction was when you heard the news that uh, the Queen is under medical supervision. So already Michael Walker's got this wrong. This woman was asked about what her reaction was, not when the Queen died, but when the Queen, it was first said, was under medical supervision. But who knows, maybe he asks what her reaction was to the death later, though. I'm not sure if he will, but let's see what she says anyway. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty sad, like, when anyone kind of gets in that position, like, you wouldn't want that to happen to your own family member. Um, but I, I'm not, like, the biggest fan of the Queen or just, like, the monarchy in general, so I wasn't, like, that upset or overwhelmed by it. It was just something that happens, I guess. Is this pitch perfect? She's just waffling. Why, why would you want to say, yes, I am perfectly represented by this woman who is saying the most surface-level stuff? 
while also mentioning she might not care as much as other people because she's not a monarchist. I mean, I get that she was asked this question on the street, so she wouldn't be prepared, but it, it, this was put across as in, oh my god, absolutely no one will have any issue with this whatsoever. This is a win. And it's like, well, of course no one has an issue with this. She's not saying anything controversial. You're not the biggest fan of, of the monarchy. I wonder why. Um, mainly to do with, like, British, like, colonial history, things like that. A lot of things that have gone on, which have been quite shady, even, like, recently with, like, Prince Andrew and everything, so, um... Again, just more surface-level stuff. Oh, I don't like colonialism or imperialism. Uh, there's been shady stuff. Uh, what's the only example I can think of? Oh, the only thing that's been in the news for the past 30 years about it. Fair enough. Um, I thought that was very well put. Very sensitively put. I agree with everything she said. I absolutely love how the monarchy is so overarching and so important to British life that even even when Navarro Media, who have a massive anti-monarchy support because they're all communists, he understands that he can't be too controversial about it. Because I would not be surprised if him and Ash feel like celebrating. I wouldn't be surprised if in private they were sipping champagne while singing Ding Dong the Witch is Dead or something like that. But just this most waffly, oh yeah, I'm not Republican because basic points one, two, and three. If that's you being well put and, oh yes, that was very sensitive. It wasn't very sensitive. She was saying the most basic stuff you can. The, the best you can say is that she wasn't being rude about it. Ash, what did you make of that Vox Pop? I'll put it this way, she's a braver woman than I have right now. And maybe this is something to mention when we're talking about the top-down nature of the morning. Yes, this woman is a much braver woman than Ash Sarkar because checks notes. She said a very surface level, yes, it's sad when someone dies, but I'm against the monarchy, Vox Pop. Uh, and this is coming from Ash Sarkar, who has been on morning television saying that the royal family is a monstrous cartel. Like she, the, that is word for word what she said before. I don't care about these people. The only dysfunctional family I care about is my own. And I just think that this is a horrible cartel, a monstrous hybrid of private people with public responsibilities and the fact that we obsess over them and that we end up putting in the same category two people who've become emotionally distanced from the family and somebody who was accused of having sex with a trafficked minor just shows how warped uh, the culture around the royal family is. Yes, Ash, I'm sure she's braver than you. And I am also very sure that you have been absolutely 100% respectful to the royal family since the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. But, you know, let, let's see what you have to say. Let, let's see what mask you're wearing today. Is that all of these conversations which people who are Republicans or who have felt themselves disenchanted with the monarchy because of the caring zone of Prince Andrew, people who are socialists, people who are anarchists, people who, you know, simply want a real democracy and not a constitutional monarch as our head of state who we don't elect. Well, I have to say, Ash, that more direct democratic countries such as, I don't know, France, who's a republic, or Germany, let's say another republic, they, they don't seem to be that good at staying stable, even though there is universal suffrage and everyone gets to vote in who their president is or chancellor in Germany. And the reason for that is, is that the continuity isn't really there. The continuity from the royal family is there with Queen Elizabeth representing the royal family who has been the head and the leaders of England from, <laughs> at the very least, 1066, but even going before that as well, with a brief blip in the middle where uh, we did have a republic and uh, absolutely nobody liked it because they banned Christmas. But now, because we have a constitutional monarchy and we have had a different prime minister and a different monarch in the same week, nothing has collapsed. Things are carrying on as much as they can as normal while the morning is going on at the same time. Again, the football notwithstanding. But hey, you can blame the FA for that. Absolutely no one told them to cancel it apart from themselves. All of these conversations are taking place with in a environment of surveillance so if you're saying anything on social media or you're a talking head or you're a person being box popped on the street is that you are more than aware that the daily mail the sun gb news you know real bottom feeders like Dan Wooten and Sophie Corcoran and, you know, the people who compile outraged listicles for the Daily Express. It's quite ironic that um, these low-hanging fruits of the Navarra media have to also only talk about the low-hanging fruits over on the right, such as Sophie Corcoran. I have no idea 
why in any way she is popular or why she keeps getting put on panels. Because to me, she is just the right wing Ash Sarko who doesn't really understand what she's saying and basically does say stuff for retweets and likes and things like that. Dan Wotton does have a bit more journalistic professionalism behind him given he used to write for the sun but i hear that he was a bit of an unlikable writer when it came to the sun but uh, i've never read his stuff so i wouldn't know but it never seems to occur to ash that these people actually do care quite a lot about the queen about britain about the history the culture the procedures that go on with the monarchy as they should and there is quite a deep admiration for the royal family and especially of the late Queen. And I do like it that she says, oh, we, we have high surveillance, but it's not surveillance from the state, uh, which is quite ironic. Instead, it's uh, high surveillance from tabloid newspapers and people who go on panel shows quite a lot and have big Twitter accounts, which really shows the massive divide from people like me who are anonymous on the internet because they are worried that they won't be able to keep their job in the morning should they be found out who they are. And let's be real here, Ash, you absolutely love it when compilations are made and you being an idiot because it gets you a load of followers. You can say, oh, look, I'm the victim of this evil right-wing media within the UK, and it gets you a load more money and a load more support and a load more likes on Twitter, which is why I'm not really particularly outraged about the things you're saying. I'm just calling you an idiot and actually taking your arguments at face value, rather than calling you names, even though I can think of plenty that would fit. They're looking for reasons to take your face, take what you said, and hold you up as public enemy number one. So if there is one side of the top-down mourning, which is an oppressive demand for everybody to grieve in the same way. I've heard a few people say this and I really don't know what they're referencing here. I'm not even sure what Ash is referencing here. Because typically, when Ash Sarkar does have people on her bum, it's typically because she said something absolutely horrific or something so absolutely out of this world stupid that it's impossible not to comment on it. However, in this case, she's somehow made this vox pop of a girl that no one has absolutely nobody i mean has commented anything on and in fact anyone i have seen comment on they have said similar things to me which is just oh yeah great she's not being rude rude cool but there is absolutely no one forcing her or you ash or anyone missing the football to mourn you can go about your day and do what you like people would just really appreciate it if you weren't a complete dick while people are in this mourning period and just leave politics behind us while we let Queen Elizabeth's body be laid to rest come next Monday. And then the other side of it is the policing of discourse, which essentially makes the price of holding a totally legitimate political opinion one of putting your career at risk, putting your safety at risk, putting your mental health at risk, because a newspaper's going to splash your face all over the place. It's, it's stupid stuff like this that Ash says that make that make my mind implode. She's worried, right? She's worried that she will say something that will get her face plastered somewhere on the Daily Mail, and then have someone argue that what she said is completely ridiculous or insulting to the country or the Queen or the monarchy or whatever. And through that, she's worried about her mental health, which is a really stupid thing to say. Well, there are people out there, and these are videos I've covered before, such as Count Dankula and other people who are being arrested for things that they are posting on Twitter. Not just things, by the way, jokes. And not just Twitter, by the way, it's absolutely anywhere on the internet because the Malicious Communications Act is the most poorly written piece of legislation I've ever seen. But Ash is really trying to say, oh, this is about free speech, when I just cannot take any argument from communists about that seriously, because listen, to the th listen and compare to the things com uh, complained about with the free speech issue by communists like Ash Sarkar here and by pretty much everyone else who just wants, say, less immigration, which, by the way, Ash is a completely legitimate political position and is quite worried about communists like you, Ash, celebrating demographic replacement of London. People have lost their jobs over this. People feel like they can't say anything and have to hide behind anonymous accounts to say anything because that's how little they are allowed to say it in public debate or the public forum. The massive example, of course, being the dreaded TR from Luton, whose name I can't say, who started going on massively about uh, Asian grooming gangs in Luton, and then it turns out that it was happening in more than just Luton and has been going on for years, and absolutely nothing has been done about it because racism. Because believe it or not, these people would lose their jobs for doing their job. So don't come at me saying you're worried about the Daily Mail plastering your face everywhere, because you'd absolutely love that. You'd strive for that attention. You would say or do absolutely anything to have that happen. Because you know 
for a fact that it gets you money, attention, views, likes, whatever. And you learned that the day you told Piers Morgan that you are literally a communist. And I think that that's something which is really relevant to point out because there'll be lots of people saying, you know, oh, you know, you must be respectful in this time of national mourning. Well, I quite agree. I think it's on all of us to be respectful, mindful of each other's feelings. But I've also read tweets from, for instance, Piers Morgan's son, Spencer Morgan, calling for people who have tweeted things that he finds personally distasteful to be deported. So he called for someone to be deported for something he found offensive. That's essentially what Ash Sarkar said. Right, let me go find that tweet. So Spencer said, sad thing is there will be people in this country celebrating this, referring to the death of Queen Elizabeth. They're the ones we need to focus on deporting. No, I mean to start off base, but that is quite a vague thing to say. You know, who specifically does he mean these people? Does he mean everyone who was celebrating the Queen's death, or was it people who were eligible for deportation to be deported quicker if they are celebrating the death of the Queen? But uh, obviously there is absolutely no point even trying to defend this to Ash Sarkar because she is so vehemently against any sort of border that it is absolutely pointless trying to tell her to get on the other side of a border, even if she ends up trespassing on my property. And so I think that tells you something about the kind of reactionary mania which can surround these things where it becomes an opportunity to quite violently redraw the boundaries of legitimate or utterable opinion. So just to make it clear in that four minute clip, what happened there was Michael Walker brought up some anti-monarchist Fox Pop person being not rude about the Queen's death. And then he brought Ash Sarkar on to have a whinge and moan about how, oh, she is so oppressed by being given constant panels on TV networks, while at the same time having tabloids say that she's a bit of a dick. And according to her, that is a threat to free speech, when really that's just standard public discourse. I don't know what she's talking about. But this is, yeah, this is going to be a whole video of me getting up clips of Navarra Media making the death of one of the most important women in the world, talking about it for a bit, but really trying to make the whole thing about them because communists are most self-absorbed people I know in my life. Anyway, next up, we have the weirdest reactions to the Queen's death, and I'm going to take out as much as Michael Walker's commentary as possible because absolutely all of it is useless, but some of it might be funny. So the first wave of weirdness came from journalists and Twitter personalities while news of the Queen's ill health spread. ITV's Robert Peston mawkishly tweeted this. A black cloud has descended on the Palace of Westminster after the troubling news about the Queen's health. Senior MPs from all parties look grey and solemn. Well, it was a very rainy day on the day of the Queen's death, so I'm not surprised there was a dark cloud over the Palace of Westminster. And I, I, I you know, I can't believe for a second that the, the members of Parliament who all swore an oath to uphold in the Queen's service are quite sad that that Queen is now dead said to be dying or under medical supervision but that was what was told to the public the ministers will probably been told that she has actually died but i don't get why robert peston who's a political commentator when one of the biggest news in british politics the head of state dying i can see why he'd be sad about that he has commented on all this politics for years and the person we do it all for the queen has died well i can't believe he'd get a bit emotional and poetic when he was putting out a tweet of the news. Honestly, I, I mean, I hope you started with the least weird. Some top GCSE creative writing there from ITV's most senior political reporter. Give him a gold star. This just seems really needlessly mean-spirited. Well, I cut the commentary out, but at the start, he starts off by saying, oh, there were some genuine reactions to the Queen dying, but he's implying that this is a fake reaction to the Queen dying, that he's faking being genuinely emotional and poetic about the Queen dying. Whereas I don't see it there. I, I think that might even be in history books. I think that's quite a nice way to portray the feelings that were going on in Westminster. At the same time, others chose to lash out. Piers Morgan's son tweeted this. Sad thing is there will be people in this country celebrating this. They're the ones we need to focus on deporting. Well, we already saw that. And to be honest, the way this video is going, I'm coming around to agreeing with him. I suppose you can only blame the parents. That's it, by the way. That's his commentary. This is literally just, I'm going to handpick some things and make fun of them. Which, don't get me wrong, I do the same thing with The Guardian. But at least while doing it with The Guardian, you'll get 
some insight into what I think or why the argument's bad. With this, it's literally just clapped to comedy. It's just, oh my god, you're going against someone who said people need to be deported. Ha ha ha, you are so right, king. And that's basically it, but I'd like to put a bit more thought into my comedy, thank you very much. But if anger is well known as a stage of grief, horniness is perhaps more unusual. Telegraph columnist Andrew Lillico tweeted this. At times like this, one notices the details one might otherwise ignore, like how perfect her eyebrows are here. I really hope they give him a speaking opportunity at the funeral. Was that really a tweet of horniness? Or was it just a tweet saying, you know what, I... In her death, I'm really paying attention to past pictures of her. And little details like that, absolutely everything about the way she looked was perfect. Hey, Michael, do you think it's impossible to appreciate the way a woman looks without getting an erection? You, you might genuinely need to see a doctor. The next round of weirdness came after the Queen had passed, when the baton was transferred to corporations. Almost immediately, as news came in, fast food giants changed their logos to monochrome. And this is from Domino's. Everyone at Domino's joins the nation and the world in mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Our thoughts and condolences are with the royal family. A really touching tribute there. Yeah, yeah, corporations got a corporation. It, it, it just makes, again... I've seen people try and compare this to um, the reaction to George Floyd. I, I can see what they mean with things like this, but this makes a hell of a lot more sense than every company cracking down on racism by... I don't even know what they... May, what would Domino's do about racism? I don't know. But for Domino's to mourn about a random guy who died while being detained by police officers, it's clearly just astroturfing and they are clearly doing it just a virtue signal. And, you know, maybe you can say the same thing here. Okay, yeah, maybe they are just doing this for a bit of a virtue signal to say, hey, Britain, look, we're on your side. But it makes a hell of a lot more sense to virtue signal about something as large and as influential on the world as the Queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland dying than it does for some random guy who pointed a gun at a pregnant woman's belly. So I do agree on most of the corpo stuff. It is a bit weird, but it makes a hell of a lot more sense than things that they have done in the past when it comes to people dying. And they also bring up the Met Office only doing a a daily forecast when usually they do hourly ones and they said they were doing it as a mark of respect for the queen it, it, yeah i do agree with him on that that is just mental but let's see where he goes from there he goes on to show this clip of an mp in the commons after news of the queen's death was made public mr Deputy speaker last night as we sat as a family and watched the news break of her death tears openly rolled down my cheeks and that of my other half our six-year-old took my hand in his and said, don't worry, mummy, the king will look after us now. Oh. He is right. God save the king. Yeah. <laughs> he, is, he is right. God save the king. The king will look after us now. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a bit of a and everyone clap story. But man, you've got to bear in mind that I, I've just looked at all this kid is six years old. Given that, I, I mean, I even remember when I was young, I, you know, you're born in England, you are told things about the Queen because you start seeing her everywhere and asking her questions. You're obviously going to have a basic knowledge of when the Queen dies, the King will take over. And do I believe that this kid thought that the Queen was looking after her? Well, with a Conservative MP and seeing her everywhere, in a weird way to a six-year-old, yeah, that probably does look like the Queen is looking after you. And so I can believe that the child didn't quite know how to handle the emotions and then said that like, this is a believable story <laughs> is what i'm trying to say but i guess because it does sound like one of those on everyone clap stories on the bus i suppose i can see why michael walker would be laughing about it but really I, I i just find this story really believable and actually quite sweet but i suppose this is what happens when you don't have a family and you don't really know what babies are like aaron have we all become a nation of cringy corporations and i mean children the parliament the house of commons today is like nursery school it's very very embarrassing also i could have yeah. picked hundreds more examples like this i mean it's it's not very dignified is it i'd like to remind people at this point that the labor party took a general stance tee hee hee that everyone should take the knee for black lives matter due to the death of someone from a completely different country who was effectively a nobody and only became a somebody because it was a useful political pawn to the left-wing establishment of America, and obviously over here in the UK as well. And that ever since that death, the Premier League are constantly, and still, 
taking the knee before every match. So when it comes to the death of someone that you have sworn an oath to, yes, I'm not surprised that emotions were running quite high. They were running somewhat high for me, and I didn't even meet the woman. But she spent every day of her life dedicated to the service of me and my countrymen, which I find perfectly splendid. Michael, I've got a very simple question for you and all of our, our audience watching this evening. What the hell happened to this country? <laughs> what the hell? This is a, my father's Iranian. He came to this country and he came to a country. He, I mean, and this was his experience when he came here, right? Stiff up a blip, very reserved. You really can't read people. Though. You know, they're really, there's this veneer you can't get behind. It takes a while to get to know them. Now you've got somebody in parliament saying about how she was crying and she was comforted by her child. Yes, it's like something extraordinary has happened in the United Kingdom. You've got to realise that a part of our mythology, our culture, our history has just died before our very eyes. Someone we saw literally everywhere. Someone who, if there was a special occasion, you know that she would be there, be it the Olympics, the Royal Ascot, the visitation of an American president. She would always be there. She would be on the news somewhere, being the representative for our country. And she did that for over 70 years. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the past, kings have died and the people have mourned and there were some emotions going on in Parliament, even when it was fully men. But I suppose these people can only see the death of a person as nothing but political, and when real emotions come into it, I think they just have no idea what to do, because they are demons, they are mentally broken people, who probably suffer with some sort of mental condition that is backed up by evidence, by the way. Communists, more likely than anyone else, are suffering from anxiety, depression, or some other mental health issue. So when it comes to empathy, especially of people that they openly despise, I'm not particularly surprised that they're being this, well, lack of a better term, horrible about it. A parliamentarian? If you said that to my old man, you know, I was when I was young, go going to school, you still had the, the old boys who'd done their national service. If they saw that on the TV, they would say, who the hell is this one? She, what, what is she doing in politics? I wouldn't want her representing me. I do love how these feminists and people who don't take men's rights activism seriously, as soon as it comes to a woman being emotional in Parliament, uh, this is the point when it's like, oh, we need to be like what we imagine jocks to be. And say, so if you show any emotion, I wouldn't want you uh, representing me. And unironically, that is oddly enough what they are saying here and they don't even realize it when in reality i mean my girlfriend's got some uh, family members in the armed forces and as far as i can tell they'd be quite understanding of a reaction like this again these people swear an oath to the queen so i would be quite surprised as well if absolutely every single person in the armed forces was emotionless and perfectly stoic in this time but i, I will concede that they will probably do a better job of doing that than tracy crouch and there is this very strange, like you say, mawkish sensibility, which has just become the norm. I don't know where it's come. I really don't know where it's come from, Michael. It's a complete inversion of all the stereotypes that the English in particular like to think about themselves. Look, Aaron, you complete and utter tool. Do you think the death of someone so important to the British, which Queen Elizabeth obviously was, they wouldn't have any negative emotional response to it? On screen now, a clip from Winston Churchill's funeral. And as you can see, people are clearly upset, and there were even men there wiping tears away from their eyes, with absolutely everyone present. And that is what I'd expect from someone like Winston Churchill, Queen Elizabeth, to happen when they die. People are obviously going to have an emotional response. British people having a stiff upper lip and keeping calm and carry on. Yes, that is a stereotype, and that is what we're doing. We just need a bit of time before we properly get back to that, and generally we're doing that anyway. But man, one woman gets slightly emotional in Parliament? Oh no, how embarrassing. It's not like she lost her queen or anything. Oh yeah, the, the Labour front bench is so reserved. All of them have got a bloody a black AVI as their Twitter profile picture. It's not, it's not a crowdfunding campaign for Amnesty International. The queen died. You know, I think that's disrespectful. And I think the other things you just talked about there are kind of disrespectful. I'm sorry, you think it's disrespectful that people have put black as their profile picture to show that they are mourning from the Queen? How the hell is that disrespectful? I don't think it's disrespectful that Domino's put out a little tweet with a monochrome style saying, oh, you know, sorry to hear the Queen die. We, you know, we're showing our respects in our own way. I don't think that's disrespectful. I think it's very silent brand, but I wouldn't say it's disrespectful. Would the Queen have wanted people to go on as normal? Yeah, probably, but people aren't going to do that. People are going to show their respect to a woman who dedicated her life 
to the people of Britain. And it's also the gratuitous self-praise. I was so humbled. We don't need anybody's, like, you know, validation. That's all Parliament seems to be at the moment, the last 24 hours, is a constant exercise in self-validation. Wonderful speech by Boris Johnson. Liz Truss, two days ago, she's saying three days ago, we've had 20 years of low growth. Now she's saying we've had 20 years of prosperity and success. Which one is it? I actually don't know of anyone who listened to Boris Johnson's speech and thought it was crap. I only hear praise from the Boris Johnson speech because it was genuinely a great speech. And believe it or not, uh, Aaron, I don't know how many funerals you've been to, but you never bring up anything negative when you are speaking of the dead. <laughs> Especially when they died two days ago. You're obviously only going to try and put positivity in your speeches when you are talking about such a morbid subject. I, I mean, what I love about this is that it's the typical communist thing to do of, oh, people are acting normally, but really it's just for, you know, political gain. When really all communists can do is do things for political gain because it, they think it's the only thing that matters. You want examples? Just look at Vorsch or look at any, well, look at this video by Navarra Media. Establishment figures can be a bit more certain about who they are and how they appear in times like this. So they, need, they can make maybe less effort. And I, that's kind of how it reads to me until that Tory MP came up. And she looked positively ridiculous. I think I think this is an issue going to Jonathan Haidt of uh, not being able to empathise because communists have absolutely no sense of loyalty. And in fact, what they do is actually try and garner other people's sense of loyalty to them. Where really, and this is why communist countries completely fall down, the leaders who are genuine communists and vanguards, if you will, they don't, they don't feel any loyalty to the people who serve them or follow them. So that's why when people like Aaron Bastani, who is a complete communist, and he himself says that, you can't empathise that people are quite sad about someone that, that they have been loyal to and has been loyal to them, because he literally just cannot understand it. Which is why he's saying he's ridiculous, but at the same time he'll go on about feminist issues and things like that. And, and say maybe it's okay to show emotion, but oh, show emotion for the Queen? No, you look ridiculous. Eh? I mean, yeah, he's saying people are being hypocrites like Liz Truss. Well, so are you, man. I don't know what to say. The idea you're being comforted by your child because a, a, woman, of, um, a woman of 96 has died. Okay. This is another argument I really, really, really hate. Because she wasn't just a woman of 96. She was a queen who had done her duty since the age of 25. And not only that, she'd even helped out in the war effort. She was old enough to. So when it comes to people trying to downplay it by saying, oh, it's just a stranger, she was just some old woman. No, she was a lot more than that. She, she was the continuation of the mythology of Britain, which is the kings and queens of the past. Why do you think we refer to the ages of Britain by their monarchs? They are that important, that is why. And we are now referring to the post-war to, well early 21st century is the new Elizabethan time. So she's not just some random woman, she is the least random woman in the world. I think most, most people in most places in history would find that rather, rather odd. Okay, I mean, maybe I'm being mean. Maybe I'm, more, I'm half Iranian, maybe I'm more English than these people up here. I don't know. I, I like how we had to bring ethnicity into it. I, oh, Jesus Christ. Again, stiff upper lip is the type of stoic philosophy that has been derived from, you could probably even say the Roman times, since they were, uh, we were part of their empire. But what being stoic means, it doesn't mean be completely emotionless at absolutely everything in life. It means try and get your emotions under control as soon as you can. Stoicism understands that you have emotions and you are going to need to express them. And when events as large as the Queen literally dying and the whole nation being affected by it, of course there are going to be emotions from that. You being emotionless in a time like this, I think, would actually be very odd when it came to the past. I mean, for God's sake, Queen Victoria of Britain wore nothing but black since her husband died, because she was very emotional about her husband dying, who she loved very deeply and dearly. But she still got on with her day-to-day -day life. That is what we are doing here. This is why Parliament is still going. Having a small 20-second speech to explain how you feel about the current event is not embarrassing in any way when it comes to the Queen. When it comes to George Floyd and everyone saying how much they feel bad for him and his family, that is cringe, and that is cringe because that is literally just a random guy and <laughs> not even a particularly good person. So no, if anything, you are being less English than most of England who are currently mourning the Queen. I find it very strange, Michael. And another thing as well is the thing from Piers Morgan's son is the sort of clout chasing that this entails. Oh God, these horrible leftists, let's deport them. He's tweeting that to get clout and gain Twitter followers off the back of a woman dying who he claims 
he claims to respect. See what I mean? It can't just be that Spencer Morgan is very, very annoyed at people who are celebrating the death of a 96-year-old woman. It's not that he is having an angry emotional response to people being incredibly disrespectful. It can't possibly be that. This is the mindset of the communist. This is pure projection. And it's the stupidest thing about the internet. You make any sort of content or tweet whatsoever, it must only be because you want attention, is what the communist says. When 90% <laughs> of the time, as evidenced through their action, that is all that the communists like Ash Sarkar and Aaron Bastani are doing. I mean, he patently doesn't. When somebody dies who you respect, you don't start sending out tweets to get followers and get clout and you're just checking the updates. How many likes and retweets have I got? That isn't respect. How do you know if he was doing that? How do you actually know that he did that? I mean, I know Ash does it because Ash is there constantly replying to people and quote tweeting people on Twitter. I know I've been a victim of it before. And if Spencer Morgan was doing that, all right, fair enough. Maybe you have a point. But I'm not being funny. If, if someone celebrated the death of your grandmother, Aaron, would you not have this raging urge to punch them in the face. Because that is essentially the Twitter equivalent of what he did there. Something very strange has happened to the psyche of these people in the last couple of decades. Very strange. I, you know, I, I, I'm a socialist, I'm a Republican. But it, it, it's pretty obvious to me as an observation that quite significant changes to the sensibilities of, of monarchists and conservatives, some, not all, Right, But in the establishment, the visible sort of rhetoric you see in the media and in politics, it's bizarre. And it's a million miles away from the myth-making they like to tell themselves. He was very, very waffly at the end there, and I don't really know why he brought up that he's a Republican and socialist. But when the monarchist equivalent of a sucker punch to the gut hits you, yes, believe it or not, quite a lot of us do get somewhat emotional. I know plenty of people who are pro-monarchy and haven't reacted in the same way as Tracy Crouch had, in Parliament, but at the same time I also know people who did. It, it, there's a range of reactions, uh, and you focus on this one woman's alone, along with Spencer Morgan, who just seems like a dick, like, what else is there to say? For majority of people, they change stuff they do on social media, such as putting a black avatar as their profile picture, or a picture of the Queen up and move on, do what they would do with their life. It's, it's really not that complicated. You have focused on some very specific anecdotes and decided that every monarchist and conservative is like this. I'm not entirely sure why. Next up, Navarro Media are trying to claim that we are not allowed to say anything bad about the royals at all in Britain. Uh, th this, is <laughs> this is the same magazine that has a representative who said this. I don't care about these people. The only dysfunctional family I care about is my own. And I just think that this is a horrible cartel, a monstrous hybrid of private people with public responsibilities and the fact that we obsess over them and that we end up putting in the same category two people who've become emotionally distanced from the family and somebody who was accused of having sex with a trafficked minor just shows how warped uh, the culture around the royal family is. Yep, absolutely no criticism of the royal family can be said in Britain whatsoever. Uh, so take it away, Mr Walker. All dissenting narratives may have been banned from UK networks in the wake of the Queen's death. Oh, I see. So the specific argument is that you can't do it anymore. Well, if they banned it from the BBC, honestly, I'm, I don't really blame them for the time of the morning. By next Tuesday, though, I'm sure Ash will be back on the BBC. But in the USA, critical approaches to the Queen's legacy are, thankfully, still allowed. You played a, a clip of her speaking in... Cape Town in 1947 right. in South Africa. Right. That's the year apartheid took effect in South Africa. They, that was something that British colonialism ushered in. British colonialism, which she presided over for all these years, was had a terrible effect on, on much of the world. Of course, there's going to be absolutely no mention whatsoever that throughout the time the Queen has been on the throne, colonialism has all but vanished. We don't have a British empire anymore. We have a commonwealth. Uh, South Africa actually being one of the examples, it was independent from 1910. So saying that the Queen presided over South Africa as it had apartheid, it yeah, just plain wrong. As a matter of fact, uh, South Africa had its independence before she was born. So I don't know how you can blame her for anything that's going on there, or went on there. I don't know how you can blame her for apartheid. Americans try and understand British history challenge. <sighs> Impossible. It's something that people uh, revolt from. And I, I have to say to the, your earlier question, why, why are news American news networks... Uh, dedicating all of this time to Queen Elizabeth's funeral? I think it's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think it's something, there's a weakness in the American character that still yearns for that era of hereditary privilege, which is the very thing that, that we escaped from. 
I love how he's saying that when some of the most successful politicians are hereditary politicians. For example, the Clintons seem to have a dynasty now. Trump Jr. is more than likely going to run to be a politician. It, there's obviously always going to be hereditary privilege. Americans just don't like to admit they have it. Because it's a completely unorganised version of having <laughs> hereditary privilege. And they don't know what to do about it. And I think what he doesn't understand is it, it's not a hereditary privilege that they're after. It's pomp and circumstance. It's duty. It's respect for one country and you have a person representing all of that right at the top at the head of state and having a divisive president every four years in the white house who is your head of state who is supposed to represent that it's not particularly helpful that's why france is on its seventh republic and britain is still with its monarchy that has the same bloodline it did from 1066 aaron can you imagine anyone or attempting to say that on the BBC or Sky, or being allowed to say that on the BBC or Sky. I mean, if someone went on and sort of said that, there could be a whole national scandal. What do you mean? Ash Sarkar complains every time that there's a national scandal whenever she says something like that on the BBC or ITV or any other channel. I mean, the clip I had of her before, all right, that was from uh, Channel 5, but the point still stands. You can clearly say these things on TV. You'd be in deep trouble, Michael. I think you probably wouldn't be able to go home for a couple of evenings if your uh, address was made public, if you said something like that on, on the BBC. Absolute nonsense. The BBC does its job and reports what's going on with the Queen's funeral and eulogies and things like that. All of a sudden, that means that it's fully pro-monarchy and pro-Tory whatever. It's just mental. And it's an important point. You know, he's talking about when she was, 90, uh, she was 21 in 1947 from South Africa. She makes that speech about all, all the... the, the British nations or whatever. Basically, it's a very much a, an imperial register she's using. And of course, by 1952, that's, that's somewhat changed. She exceeds the throne. She's the queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland and its possessions, et cetera, et cetera. But her two predecessors actually don't even have United Kingdom in their title. So you've very much gone to, and I'm not saying Britain doesn't have an empire after 1952. It does. But there's clearly a transition now to a, a monarch who's overseeing ostensibly a unitary state of the United Kingdom and a few possessions and that's a big, big shift away from what it was before the war of an empire. I love that play on, so I'm really, really not sure what he's trying to say there. But I do want to point out, it's quite funny that he says, oh, I'm not saying after 1952, there is no empire, there is. And then right at the end of that bit, he says, oh, well, there's no empire anymore. And he's also wrong about uh, George the Sixth and Edward the Eighth not having United Kingdom in their titles. They were kings of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the British Dominions and emperors of India. Though with George VI, that became just king of the United Kingdom, its dominions, and the Commonwealth realms. But it's so strange to me that they're trying to claim that, oh, you can't say on national television that imperialism was bad, when it's all people seem to see, it's all people complain about anyway. Whenever it's pro-monarchy bias, it's days like this where it's completely justified. When it's accused of anti-monarchy stances, that's the rest of the time. But it's just so strange to say that Britain's past was bad. They never stop going on about colonialism and slavery. What are you talking about? And even some of her predecessors were, of course, emperors. Now, here's something which is being missed, I think, in a lot of the coverage, and this gentleman uh, highlights it very, very well, is that Britain's record after 1952, when she exceeds the throne, is not smelling of roses. We are not, you know, Snow White here. I don't think anyone tries to claim that we are. I can't think of any nationalist that says Britain's perfect. But the amount that these communists go on about how dreadful and pure evil Britain are, of course there's massive backlash to it. We're not pure anything. Anyway, Aaron Bastani just spends the next four minutes or so going through things that have happened under British rule post-1952 and how it's bad. You want to listen to his arguments there, the link's down in the description. I don't really care to, I don't really want to put you through it, and I... I don't really have any argument other than, yeah, that was bad. Unless he's got some things wrong. But this isn't a video to research about the history of Kenya and other parts of the British Empire. Or I guess it was the Commonwealth at that point. So that's all I will leave you with today. As usual, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, goodbye.